Now, tomorrow's weather, much of Scotland and Northern Ireland is expected to start wet and windy. Brighter, although showery weather, already in the more northwestern parts, is expected to extend southeastwards to all areas during the day. Further rain will reach western districts later. In the southeast, another dry, warm day is likely. However, rain is expected over northwestern parts of both England and Wales in the morning. That's tomorrow's forecast. The outlook for Friday and Saturday. Further rain in the northwest, expected south in the southeast later. This is BBC Radio 4. It's 10 o'clock. The world tonight. Good evening. This is Alexander McLeod. The United Nations Secretary General says his talks with Israeli officials in Geneva on the hostage problem have been very helpful. The Israelis say they're not prepared to release any Arab prisoners unless they get some hard information on missing servicemen. I'll be talking to a senior Israeli cabinet minister about his government's demands, and we consider the key role being played by Iran in the negotiations. Police are questioning five people after a post office raid in Sussex in which a sub-postmaster and his baby son were shot. According to a UN investigator, Iraq had the ability to make vast quantities of the materials needed for biological weapons. Also, the background to renewed conflict between Turkey and the Kurds, the Liberal Democrat spokesman on the environment argues that we should all pay a special energy tax, and we go to the Midlands and discover why trees are seen as a means of changing that area's economic fortunes. The news is read by Peter Donaldson. Israel's chief negotiator in the hostage initiative has had what he called a fruitful meeting with the UN Secretary General, Mr. Perez de Quelia, in Geneva, although he said that much more patience and perseverance would be needed to achieve a successful outcome. Mr. Uri Lubrani went to Switzerland to explain the circumstances in which Israel would be prepared to release some or all of the hundreds of Arab prisoners it is holding. Israel's cooperation hinges on information being supplied about seven missing servicemen. Mr. Lubrani said contacts would continue, but he said this should happen away from the glare of publicity. Mr. Perez de Quelia was hopeful that the momentum could be maintained. I think that what I have heard from the Israeli side has been extremely helpful to me. And then uh, with their encouragement and with the encouragement of the captors and the very, uh, very useful support of the I I Iranian government, I will continue my efforts. The Israeli Deputy Foreign Minister, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, explained what sort of information his government would require before it would move towards releasing its Lebanese prisoners. We'd like to get uh, confirmation about the fate of uh, our soldiers uh, alive, and we hope we hope mostly alive, and if there are a few dead, we'd like to know about that too. But so far, we don't have confirmation. Now, it's very easy to supply it. Uh, you could put a video camera in front of them with today's paper, and uh, we'd have that in instantly. If we have concrete evidence about the fate of our, uh, our soldiers in Lebanon, then we'll be able to proceed to the next stage. Police in Kent are hunting an armed gang who escaped with around £350,000 after abducting the mother-in-law of a post office van driver. Two men with handguns burst into the driver's home in Dartford yesterday afternoon. They intended to take his pregnant wife hostage, but her 52-year-old mother, Mrs Eileen Mahn, persuaded them to take her instead. The gang held her captive overnight and ordered the postal worker to drive his security van to an isolated car park. There, they seized the vehicle and the money. Mrs Mahn managed to free herself and make her way to a house in Dartford. She said she'd been held in a small shed with her legs bound. Later, police praise Mr. Mrs. Mahn for her bravery. Three people have been arrested after a shooting incident at a siege in Sussex in which an eight-month-old baby and his father, a sub-postmaster, were shot and wounded. Mr. David Holberg and his son Jonathan were shot when two gunmen raided the sub-post office in the village of Polgate near Eastbourne. Both are said to be in a comfortable condition in hospital. The raiders fled empty-handed. Mrs. Frances Bustin, who works at a newsagent's next door, was one of the first on the scene. I ran in next door, saw David standing there with a the baby in his arms and they're both covered in blood. So I took the baby from him because I didn't know if the baby was hurt. The baby was screaming, obviously upset, but uh, David was um, shocked. He just sort of stood there and sort of glazed. Three men were later cornered by police in a council estate in Eastbourne. Armed police surrounded the house in which they were hiding and after several hours of negotiation persuaded the men to give themselves up. Two women are also being questioned by police in connection with the raid. Police and community leaders at Telford in Shropshire have held what they called positive and useful talks on how to prevent any repetition of the violence which has followed the shooting dead of a young man by police marksmen early on Monday morning.
For the past two nights, gangs have damaged and looted shops, and police in riot gear have been patrolling the streets. There have been claims that the police overreacted by shooting the man who was carrying an unloaded air pistol. Police in Northern Ireland are still questioning three men in connection with an attack on a minibus taking visitors to see Republican inmates at the Mays prison. Two women were injured when the bus was fired on about six miles from Newry in County Down. It's thought the intended target was a former Sinn Féin councillor who normally drives the bus. The head of a United Nations inspection team has said Iraq had the capability to make vast amounts of materials for producing biological weapons. The UN official, Dr David Kelly, spent several days last week visiting a research centre at Salman Park near Baghdad. From New York, our United Nations correspondent Christopher Gunnis reports. Dr Kelly told reporters that the Iraqis themselves had indicated that the research at Salman Pak was for offensive as well as defensive purposes and that they'd also admitted to working on anthrax and botulinum toxins, two lethal warfare agents. Though it was clear that Iraq had the capability to produce and store biological agents, the UN inspectors saw no actual weapons, neither was a facility for filling them found. The research at Salman Pak is in contravention of the 1972 Biological Weapons Convention, which Baghdad has signed and ratified. Iraq's failure to declare the site to the UN by the 18th of April is also a violation of the Gulf War ceasefire resolution. Nonetheless, Western members of the Security Council are clearly pleased that more details of Saddam Hussein's biological weapons arsenals are becoming known and that the process of disarming Iraq is progressing. The head of the Soviet State Bank has criticised the country's new union treaty, which is expected to be signed next week by President Gorbachev and the leaders of at least seven republics. Mr. Mr. Viktor Gerashchenko said the treaty, which redefines Moscow's relations with the republics, could mean an end to central control over the money supply and lead to the eventual collapse of the ruble. The latest survey of manufacturers by the Confederation of British Industry suggests there's very little sign of an end to the recession. Today's report shows that in all parts of the country, businesses expect to be selling less in the next four months than in the last. Our economics editor says the figures suggest yet further unemployment in manufacturing industry. The CBI concludes from the survey that there's no prospect of an economic recovery this year. A 15-year-old youth has been accused of the murder of Rebecca McBride, the six-year-old girl from Swansea whose body was found in a lake in South Wales on Monday. The youth had already appeared before a juvenile court accused of abduction and assault. He has been remanded in custody for eight days. The National Rivers Authority has produced a report which says that the water at Britain's beaches is becoming cleaner. More than three quarters of the beaches tested last year are said to have met EC standards. However, the testing does not take account of viruses in the water and the Consumers Association has claimed that a survey of 15 popular beaches found that potentially harmful viruses were present at all but one. Cricket, Hampshire have beaten Warwickshire by nine wickets in the semi-finals of the NatWest Trophy. Warwickshire made 172, Hampshire reached 173 for one with ten overs to spare. The other match resumes in the morning, with Northamptonshire needing to score 209 to beat Surrey. At the close they were 187 for eight, with six overs remaining. Peter Donaldson. Hopes of the release of hostages and a comprehensive deal remain high tonight, but the negotiations, said by insiders to be detailed, complex and involving many governments, are taking a lot of time. It would be surprising if this were not so. Some governments, for example that of the United States, are saying hardly anything of substance. Others, notably Germany, which holds the Hamadi brothers and wants two of its own citizens back, are saying absolutely nothing. Javier Pérez de Cuella, diplomat that he is, is saying quite a lot, but nothing of real substance. After he had met Israeli officials in Geneva today, he counseled caution and patience. I have to tell you that I have uh, received uh, a very strong uh, support from the Israeli government, the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister, to my efforts. Now we are going to proceed to a phase in which we will continue in a much quieter manner. And I mean by that, that we are going, you know, to be, the United Nations to be from one side to another in order to clarify positions and to see how soon we can get results. It would be, I mean, a little perhaps naive to expect something in the next few days, but I am still hopeful. The UN Secretary General. 
Following today's events in Geneva has been our reporter Chris Powell, and he's on the line now. Chris, when the Secretary General speaks, as, he, as we just heard him, of a, a lull and, and a lot of talking in the background, what is actually in progress? Well, I think that, that process that he was talking of uh, has already started because after Mr. Lubrani, the uh, Israeli expert on Lebanon, had left, Mr. De Quellier said that he'd got on the telephone straight away to Tehran, where he spoke to the United Nations ambassador to New York, uh, to the United Nations in New York, uh, presumably, although he didn't spell it out, actually to get this whole process of trying to get information about the missing servicemen in uh, southern Lebanon for the Israelis. So I think what he, what he actually wants to happen now that is that he is not involved in this hugely theatrical process that we've been seeing taking place. I mean, the handing over of the letter, the secret meetings and so on, and now this very much publicized meeting today. And I think what he wants is just for UN officials to be able to talk to the Iranians when they want to, and to talk to the Israelis when they want to, and literally broker a deal almost as if they were uh, trying to set up some commercial deal. It sounds as though messages are almost being passed from hand to hand, and the UN is, is at the very center of the chain. That's right. At, at one stage, uh, Perez de Quelia said, uh, we really should stop acting as a letterbox now. Uh, and, and that we must get involved uh, in the negotiations. And I think the implication there was that this, this very public image which has been built up over the last few days is in fact now beginning to get in the way. I think what it, it, it served its purpose. Honor has been done by both sides. The Islamic Jihad has been seen by the world as being willing to take part in these negotiations, and so has Israel. And so I think both sides can say, this is our stall, we've set it out, and now let's get down to the negotiations. Very briefly, Chris, what, is, what are Peres de Quere's own movements in the next few days? Well, I think he now is going to step back, and he's handed over, I think, to uh, Giaminico de Pico, uh, his special assistant, uh, and he's actually off to Lucerne to, have a, to sit for a sculptor, to have a, a bronze bust made. So I think, in a way, that's an indication of his confidence as to how these negotiations are going. I think they are still on track. He said that if he's needed, then he'll be called back, and, uh, and at most he'll be an hour and a half away from Geneva when he goes on holiday at the end of the week to Portugal. Chris Powell in Geneva, thank you. Israel's position in the game of diplomatic chess now being played out on the shores of Lake Geneva is obviously central. It holds many Arab prisoners, including Sheikh Obeid. It says it's prepared to deal, but it's demanding information about and the return of Israeli prisoners missing since 1982. Today, Ahmed Jabril, leader of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine General Command, said three of the Israelis were alive, three missing and presumed dead, and one confirmed dead. So when I called up Ehud Olmert, a senior Israeli cabinet minister, I asked him whether this was the kind of information that Prime Minister Shamir is demanding. The source of this information is, uh, as you said, is Ahmed Jabril, one of the notorious uh, killers of the Palestinians. This was not passed to the government of Israel in any official way. I doubt that we can rely on this information as credible. The Secretary General of the United Nations has shown interest in trying to resolve this issue, and I'm sure that if there will be reliable information, it will come from him. What kind of uh, information do you need? What kind of proof are you looking for? We want the boys back home. That's the best proof. But you would take, presumably, as evidence uh, of those who are still alive, maybe uh, some kind of recording of them? I uh, can think of, um, you know, recent recording. I can think of Red Cross International visiting them. So there are many ways, but uh, of course it must be direct and unrefutable information. So once that information was received in Israel, are you saying that that would be sufficient to trigger at least the first stage of a hostage swap. Israel is not going to free any person uh, just uh, for the information. I don't think that it's uh, reasonable to expect Israel to do something like that. If one got to the point of dealing concretely with a prisoner exchange, Mr. Olmert, would you see it as a two-stage affair, as many people are now saying, that some would be released, a reciprocal release would occur, then a second phase would be, would be quickly following? It's a very delicate situation, and those who are uh, dealing with it directly were instructed by the government of Israel to uh, give the information to the UN Secretary General, and I believe that they're doing it today. But one thing must be clear, 
What we are first and foremost interested in is to make sure that our boys will be back home. One can take that point uh, completely, Mr. Olmert, but from the other side of the equation and from the other side of any negotiation, surely it's the case that Sheikh Obeid would have to be involved in phase one of any exchange. If I have to adopt the uh, techniques that uh, they are using, then I'd say that if he is so uh, valuable for them, then maybe he has got to be in the last stage and not in the first stage, because how can you guarantee that they will follow the next stages if they will not have any interest in it? Because they may not care for the others and they only may care for Sheikh Obeid. So maybe the way to do it is uh, not necessarily as you have outlined. As a practiced politician, Mr. Olmert, and as an Israeli patriot, you must have a feeling as to whether or not the negotiations now going on in Geneva are heading in the right direction. What is that feeling? I must admit that knowing in general terms what has been uh, accomplished up until today, I'm not too optimistic about the chances. I don't want to discourage anyone, but uh, knowing the information, I am not too optimistic that at this stage we have advanced as uh, perhaps as some uh, people expected. Israeli Cabinet Minister Ehud Olmert. If Israel holds one key to the hostage affair, Iran holds another. It's said to have powerful influence over the kidnappers. At the same time, President Rafsanjani is known to want better relations with the West. This is not only a matter of restoring links that were shattered during the Iranian Revolution and its aftermath. President Rafsanjani no doubt fears that with the Middle East peace process gaining momentum, his country will be sidelined while Syria, Jordan and other Islamic countries are in the thick of the negotiations. Today, Kayan, the biggest newspaper in Iran, said the release of two Western captives by Lebanese Muslim militants was premature. It was the first criticism from Iran for quite a while of these efforts to end the hostage saga. Hadja Temurian writes on Middle Eastern affairs for the Times. What significance does he attach to Kayan's comments? It doesn't come to me as a surprise at all. Iran is still a factionalized regime. Uh, the clerical establishment has got a number of wings. President Rafsanjani is the head of the pragmatic wing. He would like to get concessions out of the West, get uh, loans from the International Monetary F Fund and the World Bank. Uh, he realizes that uh, the old world is dead where there were two superpowers. On the other hand, um, his radical critics are quite jealous of some of the progress he's made in um, capturing at least the executive branch of government, and they criticize him freely or often. He may not be full master of his own house, but is he full master of his own diplomacy as far as the hostage matter is concerned? Yes, the foreign ministry is one of the most moderate branches of the Iranian government, and that's in the full control of President Rafsanjani. He and his government control the budget of the Hezbollah movement in Lebanon. And the Hezbollah movement, though it might have little factions such as the Revolutionary Justice Organization, Islamic Jihad, I am certain in my mind, and I have visited Lebanon, talked to many people who are very close to the Hezbollah. These are fictitious names. The movement is one and the same, controlled and budgeted from Tehran. And as the head of the Hezbollah, Sheikh Fadlallah, told a group of Shiite clerics who went to visit him when I was there, if Rafsanjani were to cut off the budget of the movement, it would collapse within weeks. At that time, Sheikh Fadlallah said, the Hezbollah were of the opinion that hostage-taking had become counterproductive. It was being used by the Americans against Islam. And yet, Rafsanjani still believed he could get concessions out of America, particularly the unfreezing of uh, some $5,000 million of Iranian assets. Now, even he has been persuaded that it has become counterproductive. He could not get those concessions. Would Rafsanjani have the power to decide what kind of place in a larger negotiation the future of the Hamadi brothers would play. Reading the letter that Islamic Jihad sent to Mr. Perez de Quilla, first of all, it was defiant. It wanted to show to the Islamic world that uh, hostage-taking had, had been a victory for Islam. But that was part of the rhetoric. In, in the end, they were really talking to Israel when they were talking about global faction, global approach to uh, the, the issue. I believe that even though they did mention what they see as hostages in Europe, prisoners in Europe, they do not f expect fully that all their demands will be met. They were asking for a number, hoping that only half will be granted. 
To what extent is Rafsanjani looking at a larger picture than just the hostages? Because it occurs to me that all this is happening against the backdrop of a likely uh, settlement uh, in the Middle East as a whole. If he were not to play an active diplomatic role at the moment, he could well be sidelined by Israel and by his own Arab neighbours. Raf Sanjani has himself said that uh, the, the superpower to the East has disappeared now, that the world now is in danger of becoming completely dominated by the Americans. Countries such as Britain and America would have big voices there, if not veto powers. Iran has, is being pressed now by Syria to reduce its influence in the Lebanon. It's being challenged and it's, it's frightened of being humiliated by the Syrians because in the Levant area, Syria is the bigger power. So I understand that an ultimatum has been given to the Iranians to wind up their big revolutionary guards uh, camp in eastern Lebanon. And it was rumored that some of the hostages were being held there. And if this happened, if the Syrians were to move into that camp, the hostages would have been released anyway. So Mr. Afzanjani is now trying to take advantage of the situation. He's trying to appear as if he has still the initiative in hand. If he is a man in a hurry, does he have the power to speed up the negotiation in Geneva? Yes, he does. As we said earlier, he controls the budget of the Hezbollah movement. He's in a position to reduce that substantially. And also he knows of Iran's needs. And he, I believe, has decided to uh, engage in some risk taking when it comes to his radical critics. Hajir Tamurian. The Gulf War threw into sharp relief the plight and grievances of Kurdish people in the Middle East. They form significant minorities in five countries of the region, yet in many areas their culture is suppressed and their nationalist aspirations crushed. Now tensions between Kurdish communities are becoming apparent. The actions of extremist Kurds in Turkey have threatened to destabilize talks between Iraqi Kurds and the Baghdad government. The extremists, the Kurdish Workers' Party, or PKK, have set up bases inside northern Iraq, and Turkey's forces have adopted a policy of hot pursuit, chasing after them several miles across Iraq's frontier. Neither the actions of the PKK nor those of the Turkish authorities have pleased Baghdad. The whole situation has been further complicated by claims today from Iraq that Saddam Hussein's Republican Guard is violating the ceasefire agreement by systematically intimidating Kurdish populations in Iraqi Kurdistan. Brian Deacon reports. The leaders of Iraq's Kurdish population have demonstrated since the end of the Gulf War their belief that the best way to improve their lot, even under Saddam Hussein, is to negotiate with him. For the time being at least, they've left behind revolt and insurrection. It has to be said largely because they didn't work for them. But tensions have now crept into their dealings with Kurds in Turkey, some of whose members, the PKK, continue to pursue terrorist means to achieve their ends. The senior member of the PKK defined what they're fighting for. A united democratic Kurdistan is a minimum target for the PKK. It's a Marxist party and the final aim is communism. But we don't aim to transform all the poor peasants into Marxist-Leninists. Many people join us just with patriotic feelings. We have a democratic legal struggle as well, but it's difficult to find recruits. Everyone wants to join the guerrillas. It's being said that Ankara is now tougher on the Kurds than is Baghdad. It's certainly true that Turkish Kurds in the main don't have the economic potential of their cousins south of the border with Iraq. Yasmin Chongar is diplomatic correspondent with the Jumhuriyet newspaper in Ankara. They live in this uh, very underdeveloped region of the country, which is the southeastern Anatolia. So I would say that their, you know, their utmost problem is the economic difficulties and the underdevelopment, the unemployment. This is not a problem that only Kurds are facing in Turkey, but everyone, you know, including the Arabs and Turks and Armenians who live in that region face. But of course, Kurds have their cultural problems. Their right to speak their own language was denied until very recently. And now they can speak their language in the public, they can sing songs in their language, but they can't still publish books. They can't still, uh, you know, study their language at schools. I haven't met anyone, any Kurdish uh, deputy in the parliament or any Kurdish writer or any Kurdish politician uh, who really supported a secession from Turkey. But, you know, their cultural freedom is very limited, and I think that's their main problem. 
The terrorist tactics of the PKK are not approved of by most Kurds. But if things go wrong in the talks which have been going on in Baghdad over Iraqi Kurdish autonomy, the PKK could gain support. Baram Salih is a leading member of the Kurdistan Front. The PKK is a primarily Kurdish uh, organization which is based in Turkey. However, in recent uh, years and particularly months, it has been trying to extend its organization into Iraqi Kurdistan. In the face of the fact that the Kurdish people in Iraq have so far been unable to improve their plight and attain any of the basic national and democratic rights within Iraq, there seems to be a constituency, small in numbers perhaps as yet, which is identifying uh, with the aims and objectives set out by the PKK. This is very much on the margins of Kurdish politics in Iraqi Kurdistan today. But I fear that if the present Kurdish leadership fail in bringing about a tangible improvement in the plight of the Kurdish people, then that uh, experience will fuel the support for the extremist aspects of the Kurdish movement, including that of the PKK. Mr. Salih talks of news today which could further upset the chances of the Baghdad talks reaching a successful conclusion. He says he's received reports of Iraqi military actions against Kurds which are a clear breach of the Gulf War ceasefire agreement. Over the past week or so, the Iraqis have been uh, moving large numbers of troops around Iraqi Kurdistan in what appears to be an intimidation of the Kurdish population, particularly around the oil city of Kirkuk. As many as five brigades of uh, Iraqi Republican Guards are currently surrounding the city and Iraqi security forces are engaged in house-to-house -house search in the Kurdish uh, districts of the city. Many Kurds have been uh, arrested and many families have been evicted from the uh, place. The people are uh, very, very concerned and anxious and the situation is extremely dangerous and, and uh, explosive. The Iraqis are apparently trying to consolidate their position in Kurdistan and bringing the army to control the strategic areas in Kurdistan in a gradual way. So they are not engaged in a black and white violation of the terms of the uh, demarch. So where will a further destabilization of Kurdish Iraq leave the PKK in Turkey? Yasmin Chankar suggests that terrorism won't win them support, but establishing themselves as a legitimate political party in an increasingly democratic Turkey might be a more effective way forward for them. I think they should better stop their terrorist acts. If they stop their terrorist acts, and if they continue being politically active in this country, they might even, you know, get a chance to talk to our government. But now, they're, I mean, they have waged this um, terrorist campaign uh, in the region since 1983, and they have killed more than 2,000 people, uh, including many civilians, including women and children. So, I mean, there is a hatred against them, even among the Kurds. But if they stop their activities, they are a strong and still, even, even still prestigious organization. I can see them, you know, talking to our government, talking to the Kurds in the political parties, maybe cooperating with them, and may, maybe, you know, winning more cultural freedom for, for their uh, uh, kinsmen. And I think that will be the only the way for them to survive. Uh, you know, unless they do this, I think the Turkish army's uh, reaction and retaliation against them will always be more powerful than their own acts. There are already signs that moderate opinion has taken hold among some Kurdish nationalists in Turkey. Musa Anter is a 76-year-old writer who spent many years in Turkish jails for his beliefs. We are realists, and we don't want to divide Turkey. The Ottoman Empire once covered a big area, and people managed to live in it together. We don't want to separate from Turkey, but if the Turks are the bosses and the Kurds are the servants, then this isn't fair. We want cultural and other rights. Although the PKK and all Kurds continue to dream of an independent Kurdish state, there's a growing number who recognize that it'll stay no more than a dream for many years. Baram Salih. 
I think the Kurdish state and the creation of an independent uh, Kurdish entity in the Middle East is one which is seriously not on the agenda uh, for this generation and for politicians at the time because we are realists and we are not dreamers and to change the borders of five countries is an impossible task and it will have uncontrollable consequences to stability in the Middle East. We believe that the Kurdish uh, people will be better served by helping to improve their plight within the boundaries of the existing states. An evolutionary process, perhaps, one which would uh, ultimately end in the creation of a common market, say, for example, in the Middle East, where the borders between Turkey and Iraq will not be as important as they are now. That perhaps will, will lead to the creation of some form of unification of Kurdistan within the existing political order in the Middle East. Baram Sahli. Brian Deacon reporting. Here at home, the Liberal Democrats today proposed a new approach to conserving energy. In one of the party's so-called green papers, called Costing the Earth, the idea of an energy tax is promoted as a means of conserving unrenewable resources. This impost on petrol, heating fuel and so on would be compensated for by lower income tax and maybe also a lower rate of VAT. The paper is comprehensive. For example, it sets targets for the reduction of carbon dioxide and claims that its ideas, if implemented, would make possible a sustainable economic and environmental policy for Britain. The Liberal Democrats' environment spokesman is Simon Hughes. I asked him how he could justify putting up the price of energy when the country is in recession. We believe clearly that energy is underpriced. We, as a country, buy our energy, obtain our energy very cheaply, and we have paid for what is, in many cases, a finite resource, as if it was an infinite resource. So that's the principle. Then, of course, we have to ask the practical question, how does it impinge on the economic position we're in? The proposals we've made today that will be going to our conference are proposals that are fiscally neutral. The money we will raise, we will put back into the economy elsewhere to reduce costs elsewhere. Very simple example, money raised by taxation could be used to invest in public transport so that people can make more journeys less in a less costly way. And also the evidence is of the countries that have tried to save energy, even though the prices have been higher, that in fact the cost to industry go down. When the oil price went up in the 80s in the States, the reality was that they saved an enormous amount of energy cost. And if we could reduce industry's cost on energy, then we're saving the money that they can spend on other things. That sounds all very well if you put it against a global background, but if you were to view it from the angle, let's say, of a factory manager who burns up a lot of energy, he's not going to say fiscal neutrality is the thing. He's going to say this is going to cost me more to run my machines. No, that's a perfectly proper uh, question. We have to ask it um, and justify our position as well at the level of the factory manager and the homeowner, the occupier, the resident. And we do that too because the proposal, yes, says we want to tax something differently. Instead of taxing labour and value added, we want to move to taxing uh, finite resources and taxing uh, anti-social environmental activity, pollution. But what we also want to do is give back other things so that the factory owner will have some incentives, will save some money, will have some subsidies. And together with taxes with our left hand, we are going to give grants and subsidies with our right hand. We set out a specific programme that would say that if we share in power after the next election, the first budget would define how we define sustainability, would put the indices down, but would also, in the first public expenditure statement, say, and we intend to give money back to people, for example, by a subsidy to companies to have more high-tech, clean technology, and that we would subsidise, or, for example, to the domestic uh, purchaser who's paying more for their electricity, we would give them a grant to insulate their home so they're wasting less. So they would save in another element of the expenditure. I can follow that, but in another area of the paper, you say you want to cut carbon dioxide emissions by 30% over the next 13 years, by the year 2005. Now, the other parties say that those targets are unattainable. Uh, how do you justify them? Well, we justify them on the basis of evidence given to us, including evidence that's on the record from Department of Energy officials and evidence of what other countries have done elsewhere. I'm in the middle of a sort of public and part public, part private debate with David Trippier, the Minister for Environmental Protection, about this issue. He makes that point. He says, we don't believe we can go further and faster than we, the government, have said, which is a standstill, which is holding our emissions as they are at the moment by the year 2005. We say that's uh, a very poor target to set. Firstly, it's a target which we're setting. We may not achieve it. 
But secondly, the record of conversion to other activity with the reduction of emissions suggests that we can achieve much better than what is only at the moment a target set as the average of all the countries addressing this issue, better than which countries like Germany and other European countries have already achieved. So we say, look elsewhere, other countries do better, and you have to have the political will to push. Simon Hughes. The two other major political parties in Britain are rather less keen than the Liberal Democrats to accept that turning green could be costly. Under Margaret Thatcher, the Tories presented themselves as a party committed to environmental issues. Labour is committed too, but reticent about the likely cost of its own green policies. The news today that many of Britain's beaches are still a danger to health makes some environmentalists doubt the government's commitment to the clean-up of land and sea. But in some areas, ministers have found a way of making certain that green policies and market forces can run in tandem. In the Midlands, where reports on the effects of the recession are increasingly gloomy, trees are seen as a means of changing the area's fortunes, as Sally Hardcastle discovered when she went there. Through two centuries, the people of the black country watched the dark residue of the Industrial Revolution take over their land. Coal, ironstone and limestone were pulled out of this area of the Midlands to feed prosperous but smoky commerce. Successive periods of recession during the last 20 years eroded the prosperity quite swiftly. The legacy of filth it left behind is being removed much more slowly. However, in the midst of acres of bulldozed landscape, Alan Goodman of the Black Country Urban Forestry Unit told me that one day trees would reward the area once more with beauty and money. Well, certainly the Black Country has, has a great image problem and planting trees is part of the urban forestry initiative, which is really a, a Department of the Environment-led initiative to attract inward investment. There's good evidence from the continent and from the USA that areas which have mature tree cover have particular uh, advantages in property prices, maybe 20% higher. Um, it's in areas which industry wants to relocate, it's areas where people like to live and work, and so there is there's good physical evidence that uh, trees make a good business sense. So it is, it is, when one's talking about the black country, try and fix the people's head that actually it's, it's also a green country. That's right, it's one of our slogans that we use, the black country turning green. Mr Goodman's view of the future appeared more credible across the road on another old industrial site where houses have been built, grass and clover allowed to grow and trees planted. David Morris, Principal Planning Officer for Dudley Council, guided me through its almost verdant delights. There's a, a substantial amount of tree planting gone on, which we can see uh, to our left and, and behind yeah, the houses. Yeah, uh, they're quite little at the moment, uh, but Yes, they're, they're quite small, but they, eventually, uh, with, with proper management and treatment, they will turn into woodlands. In fact, you could possibly look a bit more like that, what we can see over there, where there's a balance of trees and houses, and actually yes. it looks rather pretty. Yes, that's right, yes. And I gather, in fact, uh, wildlife is being attracted here, isn't it? Yes, in addition to the substantial amount of tree planting that both the developers and the council have done since they took over the open space, there is a small balancing lake at the southern part of the site. It wasn't particularly designed from a wildlife point of view, but uh, has attracted a, a large amount of birds and, and waterfowl, and it has proved very popular. Exciting sounds of grasshoppers were apparently present as we walked towards this pond. I didn't hear them. The drain that had become Swan Lake was more obviously interesting. But according to Peter Shirley of the Urban Wildlife Trust, it could eventually be too attractive to foreign antisocial wildfowl, such as Canada geese. Mr Shirley enjoyed watching its current residents. There's six cygnets, you can see, and a pair of swans, and one of the parent swans is keeping a very wary eye on us, wondering what we're doing on the bank here, you see. Wings yes, up. swans can get extremely angry, I know. There's ducks there as well. Yeah, yes, and there were some moorhen running about. It, it looks ideal for Canada geese, this pool does. Uh, they like pools where they have easy access in and out and short grass roundabouts. They might not then be seen uh, to be quite as welcome as some of the other waterfowl we've got. So maybe, uh, maybe the urban forestry unit should be putting some willows and stuff all around the edge of this, which would enhance the landscape. <laughs> provide some uh, economic return in 40 years' time well, and maybe help to address the Canada geese problem well, before it arrives. Well, I was going to say, well, why don't we ask him now? What about some willows around oh, here? Drive the Canada geese away. It certainly would be an advantage. Um, it's uh, a lot of the richest wildlife habitats are the edge habitats, which are the interface between trees and, and the water in this case, or trees and grassland. And certainly we're very keen to promote the idea of uh, a mosaic of habitats where 
uh, wildlife can flourish and uh, it also has much greater amenity and landscape value rather than the blanket of forestation which is normally thought of of uh, planting trees. The words forest and trees are politically fashionable. The Department of the Environment has won applause for its encouragement of greening the black country. And locally, people have enthusiastically welcomed not only the prospect of small woodlands, but a huge new national forest. Trees, however, do not thrive on rhetoric alone. They need the nourishment of manual labor through the years. The Countryside Commission is examining the viability of the new forest promised by former Environment Secretary Chris Patton at last year's Tory party conference. Mr. Mr Patton is now Conservative Party Chairman and Susan Bell is directing the new forest project on behalf of the Countryside Commission in the Midlands. She needs special vision to see this forest. Take the cows out from your mind's eye and start building on the forest on the woodland from that edge and from that edge and start seeing it in terms of light and shade and uh, different environments to walk into and I think you can start putting it together. And what kind of size are we talking about when we talk about this new forest? Well, at the moment, what we're talking about is 150 square miles overall of a, as a piece of countryside. But this is not wall-to-wall -wall trees. We're talking about a wooded landscape within that 150 square miles. So we're talking about something like 50% of that actually being planted. But even so, 150 square miles is quite a sizable chunk. We're talking about something the size of the Isle of Wight. Others involved in the regreening of the Midlands are less enthralled by the promise of politically planted trees, like Peter Shirley. It's a very ambitious project. They talk in telephone numbers and they uh, think long term, which is very good. Because they're being driven by the public sector, political considerations, I think, might well interfere before the long term objectives can be met. But in terms of getting the initiative started and the principles behind them, I think they're to be welcomed. But does that therefore make you a bit cynical about all this greening? that's going on at both central and local government I think a healthy scepticism is what we have rather than outright cynicism um, I mean when we look now at what the government says it's putting into urban areas like this through city grant through derelict land grant there's new guidelines just come out which indicate that soft end uses nature conservation recreation amenity urban forestry are now going to be uh, priority objectives under the program the government is saying that it's giving 15 percent more derelict land grant money this year than last but when you look at the figures, you see that it's actually giving 30% less this year than it was 10 years ago under the same programme. And when you realise that an internal audit in the departments came out with the figures that they can turn over four times as much derelict land going to soft end use instead of hard end use of economic development, you have to have a bit of concern that they're really looking for quantity rather than quality in the output. And Susan Bell has yet to discover the size of the government's commitment to the grand notion of a new forest. They have okayed it to the point where they say, love the idea, not quite sure how you're going to bring it about, don't come rattling your tins too much under our noses, but prove that it can be done. They certainly haven't said no to extra public funding, but they want to know just what form that should take, and they want to know how much the private sector can also produce. In the four boroughs which make up the black country, Dudley, Sandwell, Walsall and Wolverhampton, talking trees is the new slogan. The local authorities want to return the urban landscape to something like its natural state. However, as Dudley planner David Morris points out, while politicians are planting young trees on one site, they may have to watch the uprooting of old ones on another. Many things are out of our control. Um, the planning system has been eroded over the past ten years because free enterprise is seen as the way forward of regenerating the economy. So you can have trees growing in one area, very nice for some people, and quarrying going on in yeah, another, so however much you might not like yeah, it. And, the, and that quarrying could be going on in an area which is covered in trees. They could actually be going into an area and stripping the tree cover and the ground cover to get at the material underneath uh, over quite a large area, and we have examples of that in Dudley. That report by Sally Hardcastle. Now the headlines. The UN Secretary General says his talks with Israeli officials in Geneva have encouraged him to continue trying to solve the hostage problem. The Israelis say they are not prepared to release any Arab prisoners before they get concrete information about seven servicemen missing in Lebanon. Police are questioning five people after a raid in Sussex. The sub-postmaster of Polgate near Eastbourne and his baby son were shot and wounded by the raiders who fled empty-handed. And that's The World Tonight. This is Alexander MacLeod. I'll be back at the same time, 10 o'clock, tomorrow evening. Till then, good night. Studio production was by David Handy, and the editor was Jeremy Hayes.
Now, a few words about tomorrow's you and yours. Here's Malcolm Stacey. We hear from families on a modern estate who believe they've found a worrying defect in their new homes. They allege there's too much sand and not enough cement in some of the mortar holding the bricks together. Look, look can you see that? That just wants to come out on its own. All right? That's just come out. That bit, that's a bit of mortar mix. And I'm... Look, OK? That's, that's what's holding my house together. Can you see that? That is just disintegrated into sand. The householders claim the value of their homes has been cut by as much as £70,000 each. But what does the builder say? Well, we can hear in you and yours at midday tomorrow.